to you Mary Ann Schnall. Although the title of her talk is based on her book, What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? The book and the interviews within it challenge us to think about women's representation and experience at all levels, from global institutions, to the federal government, to our own college. Schnall's book points to the importance of early political socialization and to the systemic institutional supports that are necessary for women to step into disciplines and professions that have historically been majority male. For example, in 1980, women made up just over 10% of all faculty in my own discipline, political science. That number has increased substantially. Women now make up just under 30% of all political science faculty. Schnall's book allows us to have a conversation about such disparities and to think through the complexity of expanding women's representation in a meaningful and transformative way, regardless of political party affiliation. Marianne Schnall graduated from Cornell University with a BA in English and from the Women's Media Center's Progressive Women's Voices Media and Leadership Training Program. She is the founder and executive director of Feminist.com and the co-founder of Ecomall.com. She is a contributor to the NPR show 51%, The Women's Perspective. Her articles and interviews have appeared in a wide variety of media outlets, from Time to CNN to the Women's Media Center to the Huffington Post. In addition to What Will It Take to Make a Woman President, Schnall is also the author of Daring to Be Ourselves, Influential Women Share Insights on Courage, Happiness, and Finding Your Own Voice, and is a contributing author to Robin Morgan's anthology, Sisterhood is Forever. Please join me in welcoming Marianne Schnall. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for coming here today. I'm always so excited to talk about this project, particularly at this very exciting time in our nation's history. Um, this, of course, is my book cover. You may notice there is a, a new development on the book cover, which happens to be a quote from Beyonce, which uh, was as much of a surprise to me um, as it may be to you. Uh, as someone in the audience had asked me, how I got Beyonce to endorse the book. I actually had no part in this development. Uh, I found out that she had just decided on her own to recommend, recommend my book in an interview that she did with a UK magazine called Garage. Uh, she basically said, uh, this is just a portion of her quote that's on the cover, I would love for my younger fans to read what will it take to make a woman president? It will inspire you to become a better leader. So. I, I love that for a number of reasons. First of all, of course, that was wonderful publicity for the book, and the book, as you might imagine, went into its second printing, as a book does when Beyonce recommends it. But more than that, I was just so gratified that she got the larger message of the book, which was uh, to inspire women and girls to become leaders, to see themselves as leaders, and particularly to aim that message at younger women. So that was obviously a very exciting um, celebration for the book. And I also had another exciting development, which was to get a letter from Hillary Clinton. Um, believe it or not, this book came out in November 2013. So it actually has been out for a while, even before Hillary had decided that she was going to run for a second time. And I had sent her a copy of the book through Chelsea Clinton, her daughter, who is a contact of mine. And I, I just remember writing an inscription that thanked her for being an inspiring role model for women, for all the work that she did, and wishing her well on her journey and her path, no matter what road she took. And then I got this letter in the mail uh, back from her in January 30, 31st, 2014. And she said, Dear Ms. Schnall, thank you for sending me a copy of What Will It Take to Make a Woman President and for the generous words of support and encouragement you shared in your inscription. I look forward to reading this collection of interviews and send my best wishes for a successful publication. With thanks and best regards, I am sincerely yours, Hillary. So that was a pretty you know, exciting letter to get. It is obviously framed on my wall. And I remember really thinking at the time, I actually hope she does read this book, because it wasn't the time she was mulling a second run. 
And not only were there so many people who said um, encouraging things in the book, basically saying she was probably the one uniquely suited to break through this uh, gl glass ceiling and reach this milestone, uh, saying she would be one of the most qualified and prepared presidents in history, but also just you know this overall sense that um, she could get feedback from some of the comments that were in the book. A lot of people gave uh, insight into things she might do differently this time around if she ever ran again, just lessons learned from her 2008 run. So I like to think that maybe she did take a look at it um, when she was thinking about whether she should run or not. So this next question inspired the book. Why haven't we ever had a woman president? And this was actually a question that came from my then eight-year-old daughter, Lotus. It was back in 2008. Uh, we were talking about how remarkable it was to uh, celebrate our first African-American president with Barack Obama. And she turned to me and she said, well, why haven't we ever had a woman president? And it was this very simple sounding question. Um, but I remember sort of struggling to answer it despite my you know, years working in women's issues and writing about these type of things. So I decided I was gonna work this into an article or an interview at some point. And a couple years later, I found myself at the Women's Media Center event. I was covering it for um, Women's Media Center and Huffington Post. And CNN and I had talked about doing a piece that looked at why we hadn't had more momentum for women in political leadership since Hillary's run. So I thought, here is a perfect opportunity to work this question in. So I decided to ask the uh, influential women that had turned out at this event this question, why hadn't we ever had a woman president? And what will it take to make a woman president? And I asked that of the women that were there, so people like Gloria Steinem, Jane Fonda, Arianna Huffington, Sheryl Sandberg. And then I came back and got some more insights from people like uh, Nancy Pelosi and Kirsten Gillibrand. And then you know, from there, I posted it at this vertical on CNN of gender and identity. And it got so much traffic that they put it on the homepage where it got even more traffic. And the next day, I was talking to my agent, and I said, we were talking about what my, my next book might be. And he said, I think this is your next book. What will it take to make a woman president? And I just was like, you know, dumbfounded. I was like, I, I don't know that I would know how to do a book like that, and I don't know that I'm an expert on, on writing a book on that topic. And he said, I think if you can get some commitments from some of your high-level contacts, I think I can get you a book deal. So I went to some of the, the women mentors in my life, um, women like Gloria Steinem, like Marie Wilson, who founded the White House Proje Project, like Pat Mitchell, um, who is, works a lot in media, and I asked them, would they be interviewed for the book, and did they think I should do the book? And they gave me such encouragement. They knew that I would um, try to get a diversity of perspectives with a topic like this needs. And from there, it's been this absolutely remarkable journey of uh, everybody who was in the book really, you know, was a collective effort, would give me suggestions of who I should interview, even putting me in connection with those people. So I lost track of all the interviews I was doing. So I went up doing so many interviews that they don't all fit in the print book. So actually, there is an ebook version of the book. There's 19 additional interviews. And the journey continues. I still am doing interviews on these topics. I'm excited to launch a, a new platform called What Will It Take that will launch in 2016, where there'll be more content as well as resources. And you know, this is obviously a very exciting time to be talking about these issues um, with this moment in history where we're on the cusp of possibly having our first female president. So just looking globally at these are some of the other nations that have elected female heads of state. And yet United, the United States you know, is lags far behind on a global scale. And then here are some other sort of shocking numbers. Um, we, the US ranks 83rd in the world in the percentage of women in the national le legislature. Um, women make up less than 19.4% of Congress and 20% of the Senate. Um, and only six out of 50 governors are women. And a governorship is, is often thought of as a pipeline into the presidency. And then even in the corporate world, women only hold about 14% of executive office positions and 19% of board seats. And that was one, one thing that I found is that this is all connected, the lack of women also in other spheres, like in the corporate sphere, the fact that these numbers are just as low. 
is connected, um, and also there are the same reasons why there aren't as many, there aren't enough women both in um, political leadership and in, in the corporate world. So this next question is sort of just, why is it important? What do women bring? And I think sometimes this gets framed, I always, my biggest talking point on this whole topic is that this is, this is not a women's issue. This is a human issue. And this isn't just about sort of like equality or competition or you know, about fairness, although it's all those things. But when I spoke to people for the book, you know, there are thought of as many benefits to why you need um, more women and more diversity in leadership. And by the way, you know, this, this larger question is about having not just gender diversity, but about having um, racial diversity, which is why it still is wonderful to celebrate that we've had our first African-American president who was elected twice. Um, so this first insight comes from New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. And she says, women are not sufficiently part of the decision-making fabric of this country, whether in Congress, state governments, corporate boardrooms or corner suites, there are not enough women's voices being heard. I believe if we're going to grow our economy and really create a competitive environment against other nations, we need women as part of that effort. Until women are able to achieve their potential, America will not achieve hers. And so underscoring that point, I mean, I think we can all agree right now that there are a lot of serious problems in this country and in the world. And we need women's voices and visions. We need them seated at the tables where we're talking about solutions and discussing some of these problems. And so just you know, for the reason of having the participation, we're losing out on you know, half of humanity. And as, one, as Robin Morgan told me in an interview, we need all hands on deck. This next insight is from Melissa Harris Perry. Um, who is a political commentator, and she, she said, I think there is reason to think that there are some substantive differences in how women govern, both stylistically and in terms of the policy output. And again, that's just the empirical work of women in politics. Scholars who show us that, in fact, when you have more women in a state legislature, for example, you're more likely to have real bipartisan bills passed, that women tend to introduce more legislation on issues of the environment and education than their male colleagues. So there do, in fact, seem to be substantive reasons for having women in politics. So I think that was also really interesting. They do find that you know, women may bring different issues to the table. And I thought, in terms of stylistically, one of the points that I heard a lot about is that women, and again, you know, without making generalizations, but women often tend to be very collaborative tend to be consensus builders. You may recall that a few years ago that the government shutdown was ended by a bipartisan coalition of female senators. And, and actually, that was one of the most interesting things I heard was that the female senators get together for these dinners, these bipartisan dinners, where they come together, and, they and they've been doing this for years. Um, they talk about their lives. They, they don't talk about anything having to do with policies or the issues. They just, you know, as, as women, they talk about their lives and their families. And so that when they come together then on opposite sides of an issue, they're, they're better able to not see each other as political adversaries, but as human beings. And that leads to um, finding common ground and coming up with compromises. And I think we probably can all agree that with the partisanship that's in Washington right now, it might help to have that type of collaborative approach. And this uh, insight comes from Nicholas Kristof, and he says, I think that if we don't have gender diversity at the top of American politics and in corporate boards, then we're just gonna get weaker decisions, and I think that's what we've been stuck with. Women bring a certain level of different perspective, a different way of thinking, and that is just really valuable for all of us. This is not something that is going to benefit the women of America, it's something that's going to benefit all of America. And I, First of all, as much as I can, try to have men, you know, I interviewed many men um, for the book. When I've had panels with book contributors, I have men on the panel. It is so important to hear from men that, that idea that we all benefit from having women, you know, as part of the fabric of, of you know, this country. And so I think that, you know, more men that speak up vocally and, and say, as allies, I think it's gonna be really important for moving this issue forward. And this is from Nancy Pelosi, who is a House Minority Leader. She was also the first female Speaker of the House. 
and she says, it's about equality, but it's not just about equality. And the reason it's necessary to have more voices is because that strengthens the debate and it strengthens the decisions. It isn't that women coming in are better than men, they're different from men. And I always say the beauty is in the mix. To have diversity of opinion in the debate strengthens the outcome and you get a better result. So I heard that a lot from people that I talked to. And again, this is an issue of having a reflective democracy. You know, we need to have our government reflect its constituents that it serves. So I think, again, widening the conversation um, to say that we, we need to have that, that diversity in order to call ourselves a democracy is really important. And this is from Gloria Steinem. And just very personally, just for those of you who are following her, she has been a personal mentor of mine pretty much for two decades. So for everything you wondered about, can Gloria Steinem be that wonderful? I just want to say she truly is very humble, somehow finds the time always to mentor so many different women. So I just want to say that and, and honor that. Um, she designed a bracelet for my organization, feminist.com, and chose the saying that was on the bracelet. And it was, imagine we are linked, not ranked, which I just thought is so beautiful. So anyway, Gloria says, it's probable that walking around female for 20 years or 50 years in this culture has given someone a set of experiences that men don't necessarily have in the same way that walking around as a black person or a Hispanic person or a gay person gives people a different set of experiences than a white heterosexual person. Experience is everything. Somebody who has experienced something is more expert at it than the experts. We need politicians who look like the country. And I think that's actually one of the most important reasons we need women, we as females have our own unique set of experiences. And when they're gonna be legislating on issues that affect our bodies and affect our lives, we need to be there to represent those experiences, whether it's on issues of health, on reproductive choice, on sexual assault, I don't know how many of you remember that when this, this panel of all white military commanders that were talking about sexual assault in the military, you know, we need women there to be able to weigh in on these, you know, important decisions that are being made that affect our lives. So now that we've established that there might be some benefits to all of us to have more women in leadership positions, what will it take to see more women in those type of high-ranking positions? And I think the thing that I found from doing this book is that um, that question is a lens into so many different interconnecting issues that affect um, not just politics, but our culture and you know, the world. Um, it is something that people had a lot of different insights and opinions about. But what I'm gonna highlight in this next part is just some of the main takeaways, sort of the, the common themes that kept coming up. This first one sort of surprised me how much it came up. Women and girls need to see themselves as leaders. So for all the structural obstacles there are, apparently women and girls have psychological obstacles. We often have our internal glass ceilings. And really, who can blame us, right, with all of the cultural influences on women and girls that try to get us to um, not value our voices and visions and try to have us fixate on whether it's our appearance or um, really try to um, have us almost be sort of passive um, and give us these discouraging messages. And this does start very young. Um, and this is, this is Sheryl Sandberg, who is a, a CEO of Facebook and um, author of the book Lean In, which also talks about some of these topics. She says, it starts young. Girls are discouraged from leading at an early age. The word bossy is largely applied to girls, not boys. I think we need to expect and encourage our girls and women to lead and contribute. So this is both the idea of like, you know, really encouraging girls, but also this idea that girls who do speak their minds, who might show initiative um, or confidence are seen in, you know, a negative light and, you know, are, are called bossy. So that, you know, for girls who are often groomed to please and be liked, um, they may decide that they, that that is something that they shouldn't do. So this is connected to sort of this next point, which um, is a really hard conundrum, I think, for women to be in, that we need to stop perceiving strong, ambitious women as unlikable. 
and this one came up so so much, I, and I think we can all have, agree that we've seen this, um, even you know, in this current you know election season. This idea, it's very this portrayal of female leaders and powerful, ambitious, successful, confident women are often deemed as unlikable. Um, and that is just a really hard situation to be in if we're trying to encourage more women to show those type of attributes. And so this is, this is again, from Sheryl Sandberg. She says, as a woman gets more successful, she is less liked by people of both genders. And as a man gets more successful, he does not take a likability hit. So, you know, that's really true. Like, men are rewarded. It's almost weird if a man isn't ambitious um, or, you know, confident and strong, whereas for women, they are somehow questions. It's just, it's seen in a negative light. On the flip side, Gloria Steinem reminds us of this. Women need to not be dependent on being liked as much as the culture has encouraged us to be. You do it anyway. You just go forward, and you end up changing the image eventually, and you may take a lot of punishment along the way. So to me, this is you know, the idea that we need to stop caring what other people think. Um, you can't really be an effective leader if you're worrying so much about what other people think about you, or you're trying to be popular or have everybody like you. That's not the leaders that we need right now. So I think that is building girls and women's resilience and self-esteem seems really key to having them see themselves as leaders in the first place and being able to find their authentic voice as a leader. This next point is connected. It's monitoring the portrayal of women in the media. And a lot of these perceptions we have, even of negative perceptions of women leaders, um, come from the media. Um, we need to have positive role models of women leaders in the media. And then certainly we also be helpful if the media wasn't always trying to get women so fixated on their appearance and their weight and, and instead really talk about them you know, as leaders and, and valuing you know, their brains and their gifts. Um, so the, the media definitely has a role in that. Um, this quote is from Jane Fonda. She is the co-founder with Gloria Steinem and Robin Morgan of a great organization called the Women's Media Center, which works to um, have equal representation of women in the media. And she says, if the media shows women in a degrading, demeaning way, if violence is not taken seriously, if female candidates are covered in the context of how they look and what their hair is like and how they're dressed, as opposed to how the male candidates are referred to, this has an impact on women and girls. And I think, you know, no matter what you think of Hillary, I mean, some of the stuff that people fixate on her about, whether it's her hair or her outfits or her, her voice or whether she's smiling or not, or Donald Trump's comment that she um, was, it doesn't look, it doesn't have a presidential look. I mean, the scrutiny that, that women go under um, compared to what men are subjected to is just, you know, is, is so much more kind of damaging. And it definitely affects not only a woman's perception of herself and other women, but obviously also a man's perception of women. And this is uh, a reminder from Pat Mitchell, who was the first woman president of a PBS and um, organizes the TED Women Conferences. She says, as consumers, we can do one big thing. We can insist that the press cover a woman's campaign in the same way as a man's. And when they don't, we can insist, I'm not reading that paper anymore. I'm not going to that website. I'm not going to listen to that newscast until you give that woman candidate the same kind of fair and accurate coverage. And, and by the way, I just want to say, we also saw this wasn't just with Hillary, even with Carly Fiorina, this, I, I, the comment about um, her face, some, you know, negative things about her face. This is something that like we all, this is not a partisan thing, something we should all speak out about. So we should speak out when there's sexist media, and we should also try to, as much as we can, to support positive uh, forms of media. This next point is, I see as all interconnected including men as allies in this movement, redefining gender roles, and supporting working women and families, which also includes men. So this is another quote from Nicholas Kristof. I'm wary of the idea that only women should be writing about women's issues. If that's the case, then the issue is lost from the start. If it had been only blacks writing about civil rights issues, it would never have gotten the kind of national attraction that it did. 
Likewise, gay rights really began to advance when you had more straight people saying that this is just intolerable. And so I think we have to see this as a major issue of human rights and justice and of making the system work that affects all of us and that men need to be part of it as well as women. And I read that quote just because I feel like it's so important to have men as allies, but also I think for us to all like interconnect all these movements and realize we're all in this together and we all need to work for you know, equality for all and see ourselves more as a whole rather than all of these divides. And this is from Jane Fonda. Feminism is for men as well as women. I cannot emphasize that enough. And the only way we're gonna make it is if we understand it and speak about it. What we can do for men is help them see that this is not attacking men. On the contrary, it's like the opposite of patriarchy is not matriarchy, it's democracy. So again, going back to this issue of democracy, but I also feel that this is something that I think a lot about in terms of feminism. There are benefits to men because we're trying to address all of these confines that gender stereotypes have not just on women and girls, but on men and boys too. Um, there are really damaging you know, stereotypes for men. I think we've seen the ways that kind of this like kind of you know, toxic masculinity can affect men in this culture um, that impacts their ability to be their full selves. We all have masculine and feminine qualities within us. And I think it would be great if we got to a place where we didn't have it, have it so strict of what means to be a man, what means to be a woman. And this is related from Gloria Steinem. One of the most helpful things we can do long term is to make sure that kids have loving and nurturing male figures as well as female figures and authoritative and expert female figures as well as male figures. And so that goes back to what I was saying about just having men feel that they don't necessarily have to ascribe to the way that even as, a, whether it's as a leader or just in his career, you know, men want to be more active parents. Maybe they don't want to work around the clock 24 seven. Um, we need to help men also break out of these same norms. And then also to, it'll allow us to sort of see men and women in, as individuals without this sort of all of these pressures that they have to be um, a certain way just because of their gender. And, and this is connected in the idea, I heard a lot of people talk about one of the things that was holding women back is just the challenge of balancing work and family um, and for, for women to be able to pursue leadership to think that they could run for a political office, have a career. So we do need men sharing in those roles. And to do that, I mean, you're sharing in the responsibilities of um, taking care of the children or household responsibilities, we need to like reframe that as not unmanly. Um, Gloria Steinem talked to me about, you know, having, you know, boys be babysitters or just, we need to help men not feel stigmatized for wanting those things, wanting to be a stay-at-home dad or have more time with the kids, you know, it's, or, or being able to, you know, do sort of more of the household share at home. And then this is connected to also possible policy changes. Sheryl Sandberg says, equal maternity and paternity leave are hugely important. How are we gonna teach men to be equals if the average woman takes three months and the average man takes two weeks? People forget that there's a huge gap in our coverage. I have an initiative um, with my organization called Men and Women as Allies, and we had just had a big panel on this. I, I work with Michael Kimmel in the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities. It was all about it working at home. And the men on the panel were really saying they actually really want and need you know, to be able to take leave and to be with their children or with a you know, sick family member, but they're, they feel like they're stigmatized for even asking. So again, this is also part of the equation. At this point, it was interesting, I just interviewed um, Congresswoman Donna Edwards on Monday at um, GW, and um, when she was done with everything that she said, she said, I just have one more point that I want to bring up, because um, it, it was campaign finance reform, um, creating a friendlier political environment. She said, which I heard a lot in my interviews, the idea that this, the role of money, how much money it takes to mount a political ca campaign is one of the biggest obstacles to having more diversity um, and having um, marginalized groups be able to enter the political sphere. So she really emphasized that this was an area that she thought was important. And this is from Nancy Pelosi. We need to create an environment where the role of money is reduced and the level of civility is heightened. 
If you have less money and more civility, you will have more women. And that's one of the reasons that we're pushing for campaign finance reform to reduce the role of money in politics. That's what we have to do, create our own environment. We've been operating in an environment that has not been friendly to the advancement of women, especially now that it's become so harsh and so money driven. So that seems to be a big point, you know, both getting money out of politics and also just, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen such a vitriolic um, atmosphere with this campaign. Um, and, you know, it's not very encouraging to seem like, you know, you would want to enter it because of all of those challenges. And this is from Anita Hill, um, who says, I don't know that women will need to be begged to run for office if they know that there's a system that's not rigged against them. I don't know that women would need to be begged if they thought they were going into a process that was fair and that was going to treat them fairly. So I think that is, you know, a real point. Like we really need to kind of change that um, environment so that it is more conducive to having women even want to run. But also the way that she used the word beg to run, that's because I found in my interviews and also there's like studies that show that whereas men will just throw their hat in the ring, women apparently really need to be like actively recruited and encouraged, you know, just assured. Um, they're often feel like they have to wait for the right time or they have to wait for, um, you know, the perfect conditions or till they're more expert. Um, so for some reason, we really do need to just change the way that not only the atmosphere, but also um, making sure that we are encouraging women who we think sh you know, should run for office to do so. And that's also with young, young people today. So this, this question, we may find out, which is what would it mean to have a woman president? Um, there were two sort of big, there's a lot of things that it might mean, and I guess we, we will all find out together. Um, one of them is this notion of, going back to my daughter's question, as a woman as a, a symbol, a woman president, how powerful that will be to break through that ultimate glass ceiling. Um, and so this is Julie Zellinger, um, who runs the young feminist, a feminist scene called The F-Bomb. And she's also an author of several books. She said, from the point of view of my generation, I think visibility is so important in inspiring future generations of leaders. If we don't see female politicians out there, and we don't see them in equal numbers to men, then going into politics or leadership in general doesn't seem like a viable option for us. So just the visual, it would be so powerful to just be able to see a woman reach that highest office in, in the land, um, so that it feels like a visual symbol that there aren't any um, obstacles or limits. So that's going to be very important, I think, particularly for girls um, and, and for boys and men, too, to see women achieve that. And this is from Maya Angelou, who I had the honor of interviewing twice. Um, and uh, let me just say that I used to get like entranced when talking to her because I felt like we were talking to God because she talks in this very slow, you know, wise voice. I'm not going to at all try to pretend like I can do that right now. But um, she says, I think we're more ready for a woman president than we think we are. I mean, if anyone had asked you five years ago, do you think we're ready for a black president? It's very likely that the wagging of the head would have been, no, 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 not yet. However, we were readier than we thought we were. And I think that's true about women. We are growing up. We are growing up out of the idiocies, racism and sexism and ageism and all those ignorances. And I just love the hopeful nature of that quote. I mean, I think we can all agree that we definitely have work to do, a lot of work to do with racism and sexism. But I still think like it's amazing that we've had an African-American president and that we might have a woman president. It is so important to at least celebrate where there is like huge progress of things that maybe we never thought would be possible. This last point that I always like to leave people with is there are many ways to be a leader and make a difference in the world. And yes, if you want to aspire to be president, that absolutely, please do so. And we really do need people in particularly young people in political office, but there are many ways that you can sort of make a difference. And it's really important that um, you know that you don't, that you can find your own way. And here are just some quotes and insights to offer some ideas and inspiration. This is from Donna Brazil, who in addition to being political analyst is now chairing uh, the DNC. She says, not everybody needs to run for office. Some people need to be better advocates in their neighborhood. 
Some people need to be better advocates when it comes to fixing up schools and keeping the community thriving. Some people need to be better advocates in terms of the environment. So there are many ways to serve and many ways we can fulfill our role as citizens of the United States of America. So even just looking around at your own community and seeing problems and things that you wish would change, just looking for opportunities, there are always ways that you can get involved. And then this is another quote from Kirsten Gillibrand. Uh, she has a great uh, online platform called and book called Off the Sidelines, which works to do just that, gets women off the sidelines. She says, I really want to create a nationwide call to action to get more women engaged, to say, women, we need you to be advocates, to be heard on the issues you care about, to be voting, to be running for office, and to be part of decision making. And I mean, I just want to underscore to be voting because I'm hoping that everybody here, if you're able, is going to be voting. That is like definitely like the 101 thing and so important in this election where there's so much at stake is to vote. This next quote is from Anita Hill, who of course, sh you know, just um, showed so much courage when she took on Clarice Thomas in the confirmation hearings um, and uh, to me was one of the most important people that I spoke to. Um, she said, take the tools and the skills and the resources of every kind that you have and go out, find something that you know is not fair, is not just, and begin to change it in whatever way you know, in whatever way is appropriate for you, but don't ignore it. Don't think it's somebody else's job to change it. Confront it in your own way and make it your job to make change. And when I spoke to her, I was really struck because I said to her, like, how, what was that like? How did you get through? You, she, I mean, she was subject to so much personal attack and people doubting her word. Um, and she said to me, it would have been harder for her not to speak out. Like, she couldn't have lived with herself. And I feel like that is so needed right now, that level of just speaking out for what you know is right. When I interviewed Maya Angelou, the only point she made twice and she might have forgotten she made it in both interviews, was that she said courage is the most important of all the virtues. Without courage, you can't do anything else consistently. And I really think right now, because I am freaked out by stuff that's going on in this country and in the world, we really need to have the courage um, and initiative to use our voices for what we know is right. And, and lastly, ending on Oprah, but of course, who um, is also one of my favorite people to interview. She has um, an amazing school in South Africa, a leadership academy for girls. So this is a big uh, passion of hers, is empowering girls uh, to be leaders, especially in sort of you know, disadvantaged communities. Um, she says, there are multiple levels of leadership. Your leadership in your own family, your community, how you lead your life, how you present yourself in the world as one who is willing to use what you have to give to others. That to me is the defining meaning of what it takes to be a leader. So to me, if there's one message I just hope that you take away from this is that we can all be agents of change, especially like young people. I really just feel like more than ever, you guys are just so much more evolved than past generations. We need to hear your voices right now. I think, you know, there's so much to be concerned about that's sort of facing our country and the planet right now. So just in whatever way that you can, in whatever way you're inclined to, finding your own way to make change. Um, we can all do, do this together, and I'm hoping that you, know, you find inspiration in, in some of the people that I shared with you today. So thank you so much. <laughs> and now I guess I will answer some questions. <laughs> Hello. I remember when they were trying to convince Paul Ryan to be the Speaker of the House, and he finally accepted and he had this caveat that said, well, you know, I have a family at home and I'm gonna go home on the weekend. And I just c couldn't help but think if a woman said that, they'd be like, are you crazy? You, and I just wondered what you, you know, what you thought about that and if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. And I actually love that from the flip side. I think you're right. A woman would definitely have been criticized for saying something like that, but how great that a man did, um, that a man actually said that that was important to him and valued um, that part of his life. It reminded me of when, I don't know if, if anybody remembers when Joe Biden was talking about, I feel like, I don't know if it was, I think it was on Stephen Colbert, who was talking about why he decided not to run 
um, for president, and he talked about that he was still grieving his, um, the passing of his son, and he wanted to be with his family. I actually think that's a really positive development. The more men that do just that, um, it'll also allow women to be able to say that. It won't be as stigmatized. So that was actually one of my, you know, I don't have many favorite moments from Paul Ryan, but that would be one of them. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get partisan on you. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. You commented about uh, maternity leave. Mm -hmm. And my question is, is that actually maternity leave in the United States? Well, I, I think that right now, I know they're passing all kinds of different, you know, family leave um, policies in different states. I'm not, that's actually something I would have to like read up on to tell you, but I think that right now a lot of that is driven by, you know, the businesses themselves. But most, I think most businesses do have formal maternity leave policies. I think so, something was passed recently in New York, in New York right? That. Um, allows for um, family leave, which is something that would also include, you know, men to be able to take that type of leave. But it's nothing, um, and I, this is something that you can, like, easily look up compared to what other countries have, which have way more time um, for, for women to, and men to be able to take time in order to be at home with them when they have a newborn child. So it's nothing like it should be, but I think it's on its way. There are a lot of positive trends. The reason I posed the question is because a lot of politicians talk about family values. Mm -hmm. However, my experience has been with this generation that women, even instead of maternity leave, put together their annual leave, their sick leave, and the Clinton Family Leave Act. Yeah, no, there are definitely, I mean, one, I would definitely look up, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand in particular has many policies a around all of the things that you're talking about that she's trying to get past. We're actually going to be having um, a, an event that is going to deal with this sometime in, in January because I think we want to be able to try to push some of these things forward. But absolutely, I think there is growing interest and, you know, I know Barack Obama recently talked about this too in one of his speeches. There is definitely a growing movement that is saying that we definitely need this and that actually we will all be you know, better workers. It's better for business to have those type of opportunities, but certainly for women, it will make it much easier. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Hi. Um, you shared the importance of having more female leaders in the executive and corporate boardrooms. Um, I have been studying a lot of uh, European companies and I've learned that in Germany and other European countries, they have federal mandates mm -hmm. in place to have minimum of 30% of their executive positions to be held by women. Do you foresee that to happen in the United States in the near future? You know, I, I mean, I, I think it probably would be great if we did, but I haven't seen as much of a movement towards that. I think for some of the same reasons that we have challenges, even with, you know, basic things like, you know, equal pay and, and family leave. So, I, I mean, I think it's something that maybe business can sort of regulate themselves. I think it would be wonderful. I mean, who knows what would be in the future, because I think it definitely has helped in those countries, both in the corporate spirit and political sphere, to have things like quotas. But um, I haven't heard anybody talking about that necessarily, and maybe it is because it feels like it would be kind of a uphill battle in this country, but you know, who knows for the future, I think it could be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I thought was really interesting in your interviews is that you interviewed a lot of Republican and Democratic political leaders. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about where you saw similarities and differences in how they were answering the question? 
You know, thank you for asking for that. It was really important to me that this be seen as a bipartisan project because this isn't a partisan issue. I think that what was really reassuring is I didn't see that many differences. Everybody was, you know, on the same page in terms of seeing um, the benefits that we would have by having more women and some of the same challenges and how to fix them. So I thought that was really a wonderful thing that I took from the project was this notion that, you know, I didn't get into too many specific partisan issues to, so you could see those differences, but uniformly there seemed to be just a general sense and desire to see this kind of equality and parity and that we would all benefit. It's nice to have any issues that we feel like we can all come together around, but this was definitely one of them. As a feminist raised by a feminist, I'm often confronted by young people who are afraid of that word. How do we regain control of it and share a positive definition? Thank you, first of all. That one of them is you, it was like men saying you're a feminist. Thank you. Yes, uh, men are feminists. Um, God, you know, if there's one. It's so funny when you have a website called feminist.com and half the time I spend wishing it wasn't called that because there's so many misconceptions about what feminism is to me. I think feminism has to grow with the times because I think it has to be a much more inclusive movement. It has to be inclusive of men. It has to be inclusive of other you know, marginalized groups and taking into account that there are you know, inter the intersections between racism, sexism, all of these things linked together so that it doesn't, that we're sort of celebrating all of us, um, our, our right to be equal and not be judged by those type of divides. But I, I, it definitely helps, it's been, it's all of a sudden becoming a little trendy. I mean, when you have um, people like Beyonce with, you know, feminists behind them and a lot more men talking about um, feminism. I also think that there is a growing sense and maybe it is one of the benefits of the world kind of turning so kind of a little dark and disturbing. So people are realizing that like we, we really haven't had, you know, taken the opportunity to have women as part of decision making in this, in this country and in the world. I did an interview with BBC about that. Just there's something happening globally where it's sort of like, maybe we should give, you know, women a shot at, you know, <laughs> running things for a while. So I think that, um, when we see how interconnected the status of women is with so many different issues affecting the world, whether it's the economy, violence, war, the environment, um, linking up how the status of women is interconnected with so many issues that we all care about, I feel like feminism will get a better rap. But mostly I say, if you don't wanna use that word, that's fine as long as you sort of believe in and, and fight for the dictionary definition, which is just, you know, political, economic, you know, social equality of men and women. And I feel like that is something that we can hopefully all get behind. So thank you so much. Yeah.